gmail.net, um, but it's plateauchristian at gmail.com, and we'll get that changed, and, um, and um, you guys should see it next week. Second thing is, uh, just as far as prayer requests are concerned, uh, continue to be in prayer for Jerry uh, Donahue, although we got good news on Thursday, uh, or um, yesterday, uh, we had been in there, Gary and I had been to the hospital and prayed over him on Thursday. And um, the story was very, very bleak. And, uh, and that changed uh, as of yesterday. So I would say maybe that prayer thing does work. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. yeah, hallelujah is right. And uh, um, be in prayer for Deb Hollis. Uh, continue to pray for her. And uh, just uh, uh, what she's facing as far as cancer is concerned as well. It's pretty radical. Uh, so she's got a long haul of, in front of her. Other prayer requests, just take and, and um, look at our, our prayer chain, uh, our prayer list in the back. For me, I love you guys. Thank you so much for asking about my back. Um, uh, it, it got really bad. Uh, I, uh, so much, I injured it again on Friday, almost passed out. And, uh, and, and I've got a high threshold of pain. And... Uh, uh, so it, it's been pretty significant. Uh, pray for this week. The medication uh, runs out Tuesday, or the last day is Tuesday. I will know what's happening after that's gone, and uh, I'm not sure I want to know. You know, it's one of those things. So uh, uh, please be in prayer. I'm fine today. I'm standing up. I know something's going on, but I'm on so many steroids and so much ibuprofen. Uh, you can hit me with a truck, and I can handle it. 
Uh, Suzanne's on her way back and uh, should be here tonight. Uh, she and Martha. And uh, Thursday, no Bible study. And uh, Friday night, 6.30, we have a good Friday service. Next Sunday, uh, everything will be the same. We still have our 8.30 service and our 10.45 service. We just won't have Bible study in between. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I'd love for us to work towards uh, is we do a sunrise service on, on uh, Resurrection Sunday. But then uh, in, in between that and our services, to have a pancakes breakfast that's cooked, cooked by the men. So it's something for the guys to work on for next year. Yes? Facebook said 9.30 for first service. Yeah, I did say 9.30. Oh, did it? Yeah. Was that, was that the... There's no sunrise service on there. Yep. Yeah, oh, no, no, yeah, so it should have said 8.30. All uh, uh -oh. newspaper might be wrong. Oh, well. Uh-oh. Yeah, and guess who proofed it? Don't you ever call <laughs> <laughs> That's the pain. Yeah, that's it. Well, uh, guess when I got the proof? I got the proof on Friday, and Friday was the day I was laying on the sofa <laughs> thinking uh, I... I think I have really messed up with my back. So, yeah. <laughs> it's the medicine. Yeah. It's the medicine. Oh, gosh. Oh, well. Okay, well, well um, yeah, we'll just deal with it. And yeah, we'll have two first services next week. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go ahead and stand and open with a word of prayer. By the way, I love this guy right here. This guy, too. Don't get me wrong. But if he didn't have to drive all 40 minutes in the rain storm this morning to be here so uh, we are so blessed to have Chase aren't we yeah, yeah. Thank you. Father we just thank you for your blessings uh, we pray now that as uh, we go into this service uh, that Father you you are just honored and glorified that, that Father we can praise you for being our creator God our father God our savior God we thank you. You've heard our prayer requests this morning, Father. And we just, we continue to pray for those who are in need of healing, for those who are in need of safe travel mercies, for just all the needs that are going on. And we know you're faithful to answer those prayers. We thank you for the answer to prayer with Jerry. But now, Father, we want to just wrap up this time of prayer again with praise to thank you for being our God, to thank you for continuing to love us despite our very unloving attitude towards you at times. We just, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
at the Last Supper. Of course, uh, Da Vinci's painting doesn't recreate first century setting, it recreates a 15th century setting, but it's still pretty uh, awe-inspiring. When you do something like that, and, and we followed up, we, we took that same practice to the church in Montana and did a Living Last Supper there as well, um, you pay attention to details. And, and so you have this, this great panorama, and instead of focusing just on that one night, with something like the Living Last Supper, you end up focusing on the whole story because the painting tells a story. Now, all of that is nothing more than introduction for today's sermon. And that is, and I think we shoot ourselves in the foot on holidays like Palm Sunday. Because we, you know, we concentrate on the Palm Sunday and we decorate with palms around the church. And we do all that stuff. And we focus just on that little bit of scripture and we go home and we feel pretty good. But I think there's a benefit to taking and really examining the whole picture. Um, we're going to do that this week and next week. Next week is a week to remember. So we will talk about Resurrection Sunday, but we're, we're really, these two weeks, we're going to talk about the whole week. Today is going to be very much about Sunday, Palm Sunday, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, and boy, is that a big deal. But you cannot look at <coughs> Palm Sunday effectively without addressing what happened on Friday. And when we get to next week, you really can't talk about Sunday unless you talk about Friday, and particularly Saturday. Uh, I like to talk about Saturday on Resurrection Sunday. Because that's the day the Bible doesn't talk about. And can you imagine? Next week we'll talk about what was it like for the disciples on Saturday. How horrible a day that was. Can you imagine? And then you wake up and you hear word he's risen. Isn't that great? So this morning let's turn to Matthew chapter 21. We'll start at verse 1. And, uh, and it is Palm Sunday. Jesus had made that long trek, just so you know. Jesus had made that long trek to Jerusalem. And all the while, his disciples are not for this. They know about the murder plot. They know something is up. They know things are going badly. For about a month, they've known something is up. Because a month earlier, or nearly a month earlier, Jesus had resurrected Lazarus from the dead. And it's, it's not a good situation as far as the Pharisees and the Sadducees are concerned. It, it, scripture tells us at the end of John chapter 11, tells us that uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees had entered into a murder plot. They had conspired to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus. Um, I mean, it's tough. And now here Jesus is, he's bullheaded, he's stubborn, he's not listening to his best friends, and he's on his way to Jerusalem, and Palm Sunday finally dawns, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to my daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, a foal of a donkey. The disciples went in and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Now keep in mind, this is important. The reason they're cheering, and that phrase is extremely important for the rest of the story. So hold on to it for a second. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, 
This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were... Oh, uh, let's stop there. Let's stop at verse 11. And, um, and let's just talk about this at this point. So here's Jesus. He's entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday morning. And what does it look like? It looks like a hero has entered into town, doesn't it? I mean, it looks like that one of the most popular guys you can think of has just entered into town. I mean, it's a pretty phenomenal sort of moment, isn't it? And the reason being, you have to know what's going on here. The Jewish people for 400 years have been under the thumb of someone else. 400 silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Actually, they had been under the thumb of someone else for a couple hundred years before that. But they had been anticipating that the Messiah would come. Now, here's our problem when we think about the Messiah and we think we know what they're thinking about the Messiah. You do realize it's two completely different things. Their idea of, and they had this concept of two different messiahs. One spiritual, but the other one very much a, very much a warrior. They had in their mind that there was going to be the son of David, who was going to assume the throne, and was going to throw off the yoke of oppression of, of somebody like these horrible, horrible Gentiles, these Romans. And, and you really, really need to understand just how much they hated people who were non-Jewish. I, I mean, we're, we're looking at a lot of hatred in our culture right now, aren't we? I mean, it doesn't take much for somebody, one person to hate another. And all you have to do is say the wrong thing. You know, I've said it many a time. Uh, we've gotten to the point of hatred now. All you have to do is say good morning to someone and you're going to get in a fight. Well, that's probably lightweight compared to what they dealt with. They would go to the market and they would choose something like an orange over an apple if they were buying from a Gentile because the filth of the Gentile had contaminated the product and they would need something that they could put the peel off of before they would eat it. Because it wasn't just that you were Gentile. It wasn't just that they disagreed with you. It wasn't just that you had a different government. It wasn't just that your politics were different. It wasn't just that. It was, no, you were subhuman. You were filth. That's how much they hated someone other than themselves. And yet they lived in the reality that their nation was occupied by people they detested. And people who were pretty arrogant, uh, let's not defend the Romans, the Romans were pretty arrogant people. And so, for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had just, they dreamed of this moment. They dreamed of the son of David. They dreamed of a new king. They dreamed of a new army. They dreamed of returning to the days of old when the kingdom looked like it did under David and under Solomon. They dreamed of that. You think we have a nationalism issue now. That's nothing compared to what they dealt with. And here comes Jesus. And he's been a pretty promising sort of character so far. And he's coming in on Sunday. It's the first day of the week for them. He's entering into Jerusalem. He is the son of David. I mean, things look pretty good. I mean, if this goes well... <coughs> He's going to raise up the army. If this goes really well, he's going to get rid of those Romans. That's Sunday. Now let's go to verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts, and this is Monday, by the way, and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. What had happened on Monday? Jesus had gone in. And, uh, and what he saw was, uh, it was a travesty. Here's the temple court area, and it's supposed to be the place people come to God to worship. 
And instead, uh, folks had set up every sort of uh, carnival sort of atmosphere that you could think of. Uh, maybe it's, if anybody has friends who are at the flea market right now, forgive me. But if you, <laughs> it would be like expecting to go to church and you find out the, the Crossville flea market has set up camp inside the church and you can't even get in to sit down. And that's what Jesus finds on Monday morning. Verse 13. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. That's probably not the best thing to say to these guys. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. So we've covered Sunday, and we've covered Monday. And he's already set the pace. He's already set the tone for Friday. Do you realize they've shouted Hosanna on Sunday, and they're going to say a shout, crucify him on Friday. You go from hero to zero in five short days. Did we do that? Oh yeah, we do that left and right. Um, take, take a look at how we handle or don't handle relationships. What do we do? What do, we do? As things get a little tough and we have to do a little work. What do we want to do? We want to drop the one we're with and go with somebody new. How many times do you see people, who, even in, in the sanctity of the church, people who get upset at what's going on and things aren't going their way, and what do they do? They give up and they go to a church down the street. How many times do we just kind of give up on the relationship because it's not going the way we want it to go? And remember, these people who are easily influenced, are watching Jesus come in. He's going to be a king on Sunday. But Monday he doesn't act very much like a king. And maybe you had a friend who's running one of the booths. Maybe, maybe, you know, this guy's just losing some of the shine on his armor during the course of the week. Meanwhile, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin... They're not happy with him. I mean, he's robbing them of their thunder. And by the way, do we as human beings not like to have our thunder and sullen? Yeah, you better believe it. Uh, it's okay for you to be exceptional. Just don't be more exceptional than me. Right? I mean, we're pretty snotty that way. And Jesus was exceptional. Jesus is exceptional. And what are they doing? They're ready to kill him. From hero to zero in five short days. So what does that tell us? First of all, it tells us the very human part of human nature. I, I think one of the things we need to remember before we go too far on this, but one of the things we need to remember in the midst of this is just how much we need to doubt our ability to discern our judgment about other people. If those people, if those people could choose to crucify the Messiah in such a short period, and there's more that's going on, but truly, to crucify the Messiah, to get rid of the Son of God, to take uh, God's favored, anointed ambassador and haul him up on a cross in a conspiracy just to get him out of the way. Um, how easy is it for us to really turn on and hate someone who doesn't measure up in our kingdom? And isn't it strange just the way the church works um, that one of the characteristics of the church is we love those, even those 
who are unlovable. I think it says a lot about us as human nature. I think this whole week, if we really look at it, tells us a lot about ourselves, and it's not good. And maybe it, it needs to be part of how we think that if a previous generation could easily kill the Messiah, it's very easy for us to think the wrong about somebody who is just plain human. But that's not the real story. The real story is what's coming next. And that has to do with the title of the sermon. Uh, and that's this next point. The baddest man in town. I, I just, I mean, when, I was, uh, when I was praying about this and I was coming up with it, I just I couldn't get past that song from Jim Croce and uh, Bad Bad Leroy <coughs> and, uh, Brown. Baddest man in, yeah, you fill in the blanks. Yeah. You know how the song goes? Hey, you know, uh, the radio station we advertise on plays it all the time. Um, you, uh, you do get an idea how bad some radio stations are because they play the same songs at the same time every day. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> so our radio station does play this song over and over again. And I hear it most often when I'm in, uh, when I'm in my shop and I'm just listening, waiting for our spots just to make sure... Uh, their plan. And there you go. There's bad, bad Leroy Brown. Bad, bad Leroy Brown. Baddest man. And uh, and boy, was he one tough hombre, right? <clears throat> yeah. He, uh, one tough hombre, you didn't want to mess with him until who showed up? Huh? Yeah, Slim. Yeah, you better not mess with Slim, right? And so, uh, um, and, and remember, Leroy is laying on the um, ground, bleeding, all that good stuff. Hey, man, what a song. <laughs> hey, man, what a song. And that's what, and by the way, kids, that's what your grandparents and your parents grew up to. So, uh, yeah. so when they complain about what you're listening to. <laughs> I can always get Tammy. There you go. But do you realize we're talking about Jesus here? It wasn't just that he went from hero to zero, because that's kind of catchy, isn't it? Hero to zero, it rhymes. I mean, it makes sense. You know, it, it just, yes. But do you realize that their hatred, their, their vitriol, their, their just plain meanness, and that was everybody. Everybody just thought that the Messiah, that Jesus himself just did not measure up. And in their minds, he was the baddest guy in town. For the Pharisees, he was the baddest guy in town. Why? Because they had tried for three and a half years to prove him wrong, and he kept proving them wrong. For the Sadducees, he rocked their theological boat, in their theology, there is no afterlife. There is no resurrection. There are no angels. There's no spiritual beings. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. Boy, talk about shooting your theories. For the people. These are just everyday people. I mean, they're just like you and I. For the people... I mean, he was supposed to be the king they wanted. He was supposed to be this guy who would just make everything right. You know, let's just make this great again. And he wasn't doing it. He wasn't doing it in their way. And so when he came to Friday, man, it was easy to put this guy on, on the cross, wasn't it? And you do realize just how far they went. It wasn't just that they put him on the cross, but they beat him. The, the one guy who probably was able to figure it all out, just wasn't man enough to do anything about it, Pontius Pilate, did you really catch what he did? I mean, he's taken, and he's looking at the whole situation, and he comes to this conclusion, maybe if I beat him within an inch of his life, that'll, that'll satisfy these people. If they see him bloody and bruised, maybe, just maybe, It'll dodge this bullet because 
What did he say? This is an innocent man. He knew. How many of you watch The Passion of the Christ? Yeah. It, we were in Florida when the movie came out. I was, uh, I was executive minister at a large church in Florida. And I just, I felt like, man, this is a great opportune time for the church. And I thought, man, that's a good way for us to reach the community. Um, but I only knew what I read about the movie. Found out that they were going to preview it for a bunch of preachers up in Chicago at Willow Creek. So I planned on flying up there with one of our staff. Suzanne found out that, um, what's his name? Mel Gibson. Yeah, I think he's kind of famous. Um, Mel Gibson was going to be there and she said, you're taking your associate and not me. <laughs> so guess what? Plans change. We fly up there and we watch this movie and get to see uh, both Mel Gibson and Jim Caviezel interviewed. And I just, the Lord laid it on my heart. Our, uh, and it's large compared to us, but our little church, 600 people, we bought out five nights in the movie theater and worked out a partnership and friendship with the local, minute, uh, local owner of the movie theater. And we bought out five nights. And then told our people, give the tickets away. Don't have your friends buy the tickets. You buy it for your friends and then bring them in there. Now I'll tell you, I watched that movie six times in a week's time. For those of you who watched it, is that an emotional movie? No. Yeah. So do you understand that you take and you watch that, that blood, that beating that he took, and it's pretty realistic. Pontius Pilate's just attitude, maybe this will satisfy them. And do you realize just how deadly we are in our attitudes about one another that this truly is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And still, they had reduced him to a zero. They had made him the baddest man in town. And they hauled him up on that cross. And they still killed him. And then they cheered for it to happen. And the difference between they and the me that much. If I had been there, I don't know. Would I be one of the ones cheering? Maybe. But I'd be there. Would I be like John, just cowering in the corner? Maybe. Would I be like Peter, denying Jesus? I tend to identify with Peter a lot. Maybe I'd be more like Peter. Would I be one of the conspirators? The conspirators? I don't know. But I do know this. I am human, just as human as any of those people are. And if I'm really brutally honest with myself, I would have been doing something like what they did. But I don't think we're, as I've set you up, I don't think we really understand the beauty, the irony of what we're talking about, the baddest man in town. Because do you realize that when we talk about Sunday, Palm Sunday, when we get to Friday, he hung on that cross, and for a microsecond, for a moment, he was literally the baddest man in town. Because unbeknownst to us, I mean, in a plan that's far smarter than anything any human being could ever develop, he took on every one of your sins, every one of my sins, of the 7 billion people who have lived on the earth and the 7 billion that are living now, and then counting. Every one of those sins ended up on Jesus. And for a moment, that, that crazy moment when the Son of God hung on that cross and he poured out his heart and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For that moment, he was the baddest man in town. Not because he was bad, but because your dad was on him. 
So I'm going to have the guys go back, or the folks go back, grab the communion. Let's pass it out. And let's read probably one of the most passionate passages. Let this really, this whole section, just be our communion meditation. Because hundreds, hundreds of years before it happened, Isaiah laid out the beauty of what happened on Friday for us to really meditate upon. So as, this, as these communion packs come out, just take and have them in front of you. Have them prepped as we read this passage together. Isaiah 53.1 Who has believed what we have heard and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He didn't have any impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that God not only packaged him in a very plain, rapid but he told us 800 years before he did it that he was going to do it that way. Plain package, Jesus. Do you see him? Plain package, boy from Nazareth. Plain package, boy raised by a poor carpenter and his wife. Plain package, Jesus. He's just, man, he, he just, he was average. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. By the way, did we get there this morning talking about how we can go from hero to zero in our eyes from Sunday to Friday? Yeah. We could even despise the Son of God we can even get to the point we don't value him. That's what human beings do. Surely, oh, here's the communion. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Yeah, he was picked on by God. That's not why he's suffering. He's not suffering for us. Because we can't see the plain truth. But he was pierced because of our transgressions. So every sin you've ever committed, he was pierced for it. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. So the cost of peace with God was that Jesus himself would suffer your punishment. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him. For the iniquity of us all. Can you imagine the weight of that? 14 billion people and counting. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Wow. The Gospel Week, the Passion Week, all wrapped up in one chapter of Isaiah. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased. What? You know, the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Do you, do you realize that that verse just spoke of God's immense love for you? When you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see it out of his anguish, and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as a spoil, because he has submitted himself to death 
and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. The great irony of Friday is that we have a God who loves us so much. The great irony of Friday is we are the ones who crucified him. We are the ones who cheered his death. We are the ones who just wanted it to happen, and yet God loved us so much, he turned it around and made it our salvation plan. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like probably the most phenomenal love that has ever been written about in the history of mankind. Yeah. So in that moment, the baddest man in town, the baddest man in history, was bad only because of your evil. And when we take this cup, when we take these emblems, it's a reminder to us of just what that Resurrection Sunday is all about. What that Good Friday is all about. But it also tells us a lot about our Palm Sunday, isn't it? It tells us we can cheer on Sunday, but we can jeer on Friday. Father, at this moment, as we consider all that you have done, may we be truly grateful. Father, as we take this bread right now, as we give you thanks. We give you thanks for what it represents. We give you thanks just for your incredible love story. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, as we take this cup, this covenant, Father, May the visual picture from that movie, may that haunt us right now. May it remind us that this isn't, that was a grape juice stripped down on the face of an actor. <clears throat> Rather, Father, it was the blood of the most holy one shed for us. What an awesome price. And may we remember it. Not that we're confined by guilt, Father. Forgive us if we beat ourselves up with guilt. Rather, Father, may this moment, may we be free. May we realize our freedom like never before and realize you have set us free even from our own prisons, of our own making. built in our image. Father, may we be proud to be called children of the Most High God. And may this spur us on to be greater at being messengers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Even as a kid, I struggled <laughs> with, the, uh, with the emphasis that the church puts on Christmas, which the Bible really doesn't talk about the way we talk about it. It's, it's always, even from my newly baptized at the age of 12, it just was incredible to me that we didn't make as big a fuss as we should about the resurrection. This is core to who we are. If you go out those doors and you do not realize what the, what the crucifixion and the resurrection means for all of humanity, then we fail. We do. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt, which is nice and cute. We're going to have 
you know, all those cute little colors out there, but we're going to have a ton of people here, and maybe a bunch of them will be unchurched. And I want to tell you, just if statistics tell us anything, the vast majority of people in this place, which is considered the Bible Belt, do not know Jesus as Lord and Christ. We have a target-rich environment out there. Jesus wants them back. Agreed? Yes. Father, let's, st here, let's stand. We'll, we'll close in prayer. Father, we just pray for, for our good Friday as we get to it. May it be a glory, hallelujah, remembrance. It may me be weird in the world's eyes of talking about the death of a man on a cross 2,000 years ago and rejoicing that that took place. May we reflect what Paul told us, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But then we would just want to be thankful in advance for next Sunday as we remember the resurrection. Father, pack this place out. Even if we're not good at bringing folks here, I just pray in Jesus' name your Holy Spirit moves and you just pack this place out so that the gospel might be preached to listening ears. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You all be blessed. Have a great day. And yes, my back's still moving. Jonathan, you mentioned it. Man, I love the fact I don't know why. You're mean. I do What do you want? I was telling